Celtic Badass of the Week showcases a different badass person of Celtic heritage each week. Those who exemplify the give no shit attitude and come on on top. They may come from our past or our present, but rest assured they come from all walks of life and legend. They are men, women, even old ladies and pirate queens. You don't have to be a muscled up Celt in a fur kilt swinging a mighty sword. You can just be a 4 foot 11 Welsh woman and suffragette who knows jujitsu. Most of these badasses are all too real. While some may be only legend, badass legends though. The only prerequisite for this title is Celtic blood and badassedness. Alright, this week's little Celtic badass is a Welsh woman named Edith Garud. And she's quoted as saying that physical force seems to be the only thing in which women have not demonstrated their equality to men. And whilst we are waiting for evolution, which is slowly taking place and bringing about that equality, we might as well just take time by the forelock and use jiu-jitsu. Now, it wasn't just that Edith Garud was the first female martial arts instructor in the Western world, and it wasn't just that this hardcore pipe-hitting 4 foot 11 tall chick went out there in an Edwardian hoop skirt and a massive floppy hat and judo flipped the hell out of armed men who outweighed her 2 to 1, and it wasn't that she was one of the first fi uh, fight cho uh, choreographers in British film history or that she kept a damn bowling pin under her dress and three inches of cardboard armor to keep from protecting her ribs from getting hit by the police clubs. Now, it's, it's that this hell-raising uh, martial arts master was using her powers of feminine ass-kicking to smash the faces of London police officers who tried to violently break up women's suffrages rallies, and that her skills and techniques were used to train a 30-woman strong bodyguard of jiu-jitsu facebreaker suffragettes who could be assembled at a moment's notice and immediately start pummeling the balls out of any jackasses who thought they could stand in the way of the women's right to vote. Oh yeah! And this is going down in 1908, by the way, at a time when women were only supposed to be considered well-behaved. They weren't supposed to give a crap about things like voting or politics or literature or complaining about getting beat up by their husbands. You know, the only hors d'oeuvres that Edith Garud was interested in serving, however, involved a couple steaming hot plates of knuckle sandwiches shoved violently down the esophagus of anyone stupid enough to mess with her. She'll flip you. She'll flip you for real. Edith Margaret Williams was born in Somerset, 1872, but moved back to Wales where her parents were born. Not long after that, and eventually ended up hooking up with a strapping young physical edu education instructor named William Garud, a ripped to shreds boxer, wrestler, and badass martial arts instructor who wrote a book about jiu-jitsu and used to spend his days training Welsh athletes in the fine art of one-arm pull-ups and climbing the rope in gym class without getting Indian burns on their scrotums. Edith and William got hitched. He taught her a bunch of hardcore wrist locks and hip tosses. And before long, this chick was using bone crunching MMA uh, techniques to mess up dudes twice her size and then kick them in the jaw once they were incapacitated and emasculated. At some point during their early married life, the Garudes met William Barton Wright, a fellow gym coach and the inventor of an unbelievable, awesome martial arts style known as Baritsu. If that name rings a bell, it's probably because this combination of stick fighting, gentlemanly bare knuckle boxing, French savate, and Kobe style jiu-jitsu is the same style of martial arts Sher Sherlock Holmes used to ball punch his way through every overly complex crime London had to offer. Now, uh, after training in Baritsu from the dude that invented it, she then went to Soho and studied Tokyo-style jiu-jitsu with uh, Sadakaza Uyashi, the first jiu-jitsu master to ever teach pupils outside of Japan. She became a master in using leverage and mechanics to overpower larger men and perform incredible feats of strength. And by 1907, the 35-year-old Miss Garud was so tight that she actually starred in the United Kingdom's first martial arts film, a silent movie called Jiu-Jitsu Takes Down the Footpads, where some douchebag hoodlum tries to jack her purse and she goes Jackie Chan on his ass until his demasculated body smeared quivering on the 
uh, sidewalk crying for his mama. Well, performing public display is a badassery, opening a couple of jiu-jitsu training facilities and becoming England's first Michelle Yeoh was great and all, but around 1908, stuff got serious for Edith Garud, and her services suddenly became desperately needed by the quickly ramping up women's suffrage movement, movement in England. Now basically, this was the deal. Women in England thought it would be pretty cool if they could vote, inherit land, ask for a divorce, and have some kind of legal precedent established preventing them from being put to work at eight years old. Now, a bunch of guys thought this was bullshit. So every time a group of women would get together and demand this stuff, these guys would show up with a bunch of cops and beat the crap out of them. Now, this was kind of a problem for Edith Garud. So, from 1907 through 1914, she opened the doors of her jiu-jitsu school to train suffragettes to fight back. And I don't mean the non-violent Gandhi turned the other cheek I mean, in the, any part that you touches me, I'm going to be detached from your body sense. Now, running her woman-only training halls, she assembled a band of 30 hardcore women that she trained intensely in martial arts, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and general badassery. Now, equipped them with weapons and armor, and then assigned these jiu-jitsu suffragettes to serve as the personal bodyguard of a suffragette leader named Emmeline Pinkhurst. The leader of the Women's Social and Political Union, Emmeline Pinkhurst, was kind of like the Susan B. Anthony of England, only if Susan B. Anthony uh, urged her followers to smash the windows out of police stations with Molotov cocktails, break into Congress and the White House to yell at politicians, and spend half of her activist career breaking out of no fewer than seven federal prisons. Now here's roughly how it worked. Pankhurst would have a suffrage rally, get arrested for disturbing the peace or something like that, starve herself to death in prison, force them to release her for health reasons, and they'll go right back out and do it again. Eventually, hordes of cops and unpleasant young men, opposed to the idea of women voting, became such a big deal that Edith Garud was called in to layeth the smack down. Now, Garud responded by assembling the bodyguard. That's those 30 women trained in jiu-jitsu and capable of using improvised weapons to fight off any jerk who tried to mess with Pankhurst. Now, the women would be out there in big dresses and hats looking all totally normal and all frilly and everything, but underneath their heavy wool dresses, they would have three inches of cardboard wrapped around their midsections to prevent them from breaking ribs when they were clubbed by the police. Oh, right, and under their dresses, they'd be packing Indian clubs which are basically bowling pin looking things that really seem like they'd hurt like a bitch if you got popped with one. So you can say what you want about the ethics of fighting the cops or whatever, but the bodyguard's record is pretty damn badass if you ask me. Meeting in attics and basements and taking long routes home to keep police inspectors from following them and learning their identities. The women of the guard not only planned cunning disguise and decoy operations to throw the fuzz off Pankhurst's trail, they also got out there and mixed it up with the man on dozens of occasions. Like one time, Pankhurst was giving a talk at a town hall, and 50 cops come running in with clubs to break it up. They were faced off by 25 women with Indian clubs swinging like maniacs, bashing in heads left and right. When the cops tried to climb up on stage after Pankhurst, they quickly learned that the garlands of flowers draped around the stage were decorative, but actually concealed barbed wire fencing that ripped them up and funneled them all into a choke point where the guard could stand their ground. Another time, a small group of uh, the guard were attacked while escorting Pankers to a different talk and had to take over a dozen armed men, uh, cops. The cops eventually overpowered the women, knocked Pankhurst unconscious, and uh, fought through the horde of club swing and suffragettes only to later learn that the women they arrested was actually Pankhurst's body double. Now, while Garud herself was uh, rarely involved in these frays, uh, there's more than one record recorded instance of her flipping cops weighing at least 180 pounds. One London newspaper read, Women using jiu-jitsu have brought great burly cowards nearly twice their size to their feet and made them howl for mercy. Well, the militant suffragette movement took a break for the Great War in 1914, but their voices were heard loud and clear. 
and before the war was over, an act was passed that granted over 8 million British women the right to vote. Garud no longer needed to organize an underground female fight club trained in the fine art of punching cops, but she continued to run her schools, wrote a couple magazine articles about self-defense, and ran the Women's Athletes branch of the Women's Freedom League. Later in life, she taught classes to the London police officers who were curious of what the whole jiu-jitsu cop flipping thing was all about. And once she knew the techniques weren't going to be used to oppress her friends, Edith was happy to oblige them and worked as a martial arts fight choreographer for stage and film. She lived to be 99 years old, passing away in 1971. In one of her final interviews, the 93-year-old martial artist responded to the interviewer's question by giving him the recipe she had just used for her birthday cake in June 2012. Her... <laughs> In June 2012, her hometown of Islington recognized her as a total badass by installing a plaque in her honor at the site of her former home. Now that's cool. 